Uh, thank you, Brenda, and uh, welcome, everyone. I appreciate uh, the invitation to be here today and present on uh, some of the new technology that our company has uh, put forward. So with that, I'm just going to dive right in, and please feel free to uh, add any questions you have in the comments. Uh, if we can't get to them today, uh, I'm sure the team will forward them on to me, and I will uh, do my best to get answers to you as quickly as possible. So what we're going to talk about today is just very briefly, if I can get this working. Um, what is, we're going to talk a little bit about what necrotic enteritis is. Most of you are probably already aware. A little bit about clostridium perfringens and how it works. Then we're going to talk about general uh, necrol, necrotic enteritis control measures. And then we're going to get into the nitty gritty about the vaccine et cetera, uh, itself and uh, some data on some of the clinical efficacy under control challenge studies, as well as some data from field performances uh, that have been done in Canada over the last uh, couple of years. So let's uh, dive right into a little bit about necrotic enteritis. So most of you know uh, that uh, necrotic enteritis is a uh, fairly invasive disease, and you'll see on the next slide a little bit of information on the, the economic impacts, but it really arises as a result of uh, damage to the intestinal tract. It's not necessarily a primary pathogen, but what we call more of a secondary pathogen. And that's due to things like uh, nutritional imbalances, uh, stressors such as heat or cold stress. Um, and the number one is uh, imeria or coxy that predisposes to uh, the proliferation of clostridium. And the real cause is not just the clostridium by itself, but under the right conditions, it produces what we call some virulence factors known as toxins. And it's those toxins that ultimately cause necrotic enteritis and some of the associated performance loss and mortality. One of the interesting things, uh, and there's a couple factors here that I'm going to highlight re relative to clostridium perfringens, and one is it's oxotrophic, which essentially means that it needs 16 essential uh, amino acids in order to, to reproduce and survive. And that's because they, they can't synthesize amino acids on their own, so they need to get those from their host. The other one, uh, besides being anaerobic, is that it's ubiquitous, basically meaning that it's everywhere. It's in the soil, dust, feed, it's in, always present in the intestinal tract and in the litter, and you can find it everywhere. It doesn't mean that it always causes issues, but because it is there, if you have uh, predisposing factors, um, you can have some challenges with uh, both clinical and subclinical necrotic enteritis. So we know that necrotic enteritis is a major uh, global economic impact to the industry. Um, and that's largely because uh, of the magnitude of the impacts. And so when we talk about clinical, um, we're talking about diseases that can induce mortality up to 40% of the flock. However, subclinical uh, is one that we really don't diagnose very often. And it's really related to poor productivity such as reduced growth, higher uh, feed efficiency, uh, reduced fish feed efficiency, et cetera. And that can have the impacts uh, of up to 12% on body weight and feed conversion. And depending on the flock size, uh, can amount to you know, $1,500 per, per flock just on reduced uh, animal performance. And this is data that is quite dated already. It's 13 years ago. And with the economic costs of feed that have doubled pretty much since that time, uh, we can anticipate that those costs have gone up quite a bit more. And obviously, the larger the flock, the bigger the economic impact that could have. So we know that uh, necrotic enteritis has a number of factors. It produces, uh, well, let me say there's different types of clostridium. And the type A is the one that causes necrotic enteritis. And that type A produces a number of toxins. Um, the two that are known that cause lesions are alpha toxin, and it's a membrane active phospholipase that uh, requires uh, calcium in order to function. This one has been known probably since the uh, the 70s um, and, and quite, uh, quite uh, impactful. The other one is called net B toxin, and it's a pore forming toxin. 
um, that was identified early in the in the early 2000s. I think it was 2006 or 2007 from Anthony Keeburn in uh, in Australia. What's interesting about this particular toxin um, is that it has a collagen adherence locus in the uh, in the toxin. And I'll come back to why that's important a little bit later when we talk about some control strategies. So how does it work? Well, necrotic enteritis is a complex disease. Um, now, I only show this slide to illustrate the complexity of the factors that can go into predisposing to necrotic enteritis. And you'll see a large number of factors, nutritional, uh, management such that could have impacts on immunosuppression, uh, stocking density, uh, as well as other nutritional factors such as the types of raw materials you have, the, the inclusion or not of uh, nutritional supplements. The key message here is that it's complex and there is no single one silver bullet because no technology in feed or otherwise will tackle all of these uh, interacting factors. So when we're looking at controlling the necrotic enteritis, it's really best to take a holistic approach and tackle the challenge from a number of different avenues. So we'll come back to, uh, to some of those uh, control strategies in a bit. Um, beyond those that I'm gonna talk about here, which are really formulation strategies. And this is just a, 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 an example. It doesn't mean that this encompasses all of the, uh, the the strategies they can use from a formulation perspective. But you might recall that I talked about uh, Clostridium perfringens being oxotrophic, so it requires amino acids from the host. And one strategy that you could use from a nutritional perspective is to reduce the amount of crude protein in your, in your diet. And you can do that by balancing uh, your protein using synthetic amino acids. And what that does is it makes your um, protein level lower going into the hindgut where clostridium typically proliferates and minimizing the amount of food that those bacteria can use that are indigestible. And by digestibility, we also talk about how do we use different types of raw materials. So making sure that you use raw materials that have a higher uh, digestibility than other raw materials can help reduce the amount of crude protein in your diets. You'll also recall that I mentioned uh, that uh, the toxin itself, uh, one of the toxins I should say, net B, has a collagen adherence locus. And what that means is that it binds to collagen, which is an animal protein, so that if you limit the use of fish meal, meat and bone meal, uh, or other animal byproducts that might contain collagen, could theoretically help reduce um, uh, the proliferation of clostridium perfringens in the gut. And in my previous uh, work, I had developed a, a challenge model on necrotic enteritis and were able to demonstrate that this is indeed a key factor in predispo uh, predisposing to necrotic. Uh, third one is uh, the use of, ca uh, of uh, calcium levels. So uh, as one of the phospholipid binding proteins is calcium dependent, the alpha toxin, um, the more available calcium you have in your diet, uh, the more you have a predisposition. So one strategy is to reduce your level of calcium. Uh, you can't go to zero, obviously, because uh, birds need calcium for bone development. But one strategy is to also look at using uh, a phytase with appropriate calcium and phosphorus matrix values to reduce the overage that we currently have. And uh, should CFIA implement uh, with Gazette 2 this fall, as they promised for a number of years, uh, we will have uh, less restriction on calcium and we'll be able to uh, formulate more appropriately. And finally, obviously, with uh, different types of grains, such as rye, wheat, barley, uh, they increase digestive viscosity um, and uh, increase mucus production, which can lead to uh, bacterial overgrowth. And so the idea here is to use a, a, a carbohydrate enzyme to reduce some of that to mitigate some of those effects. So beyond formulation, there's also a number of management factors, and these are really um, best practices, if you will. So as I mentioned, uh, Imeria or Coxy is the biggest predisposing factor to necrotic enteritis, and that's why a lot of challenge models use uh, Coxy as a co-infection to in, in instigate uh, necrotic enteritis. 
So having a good Imeria control strategy and rotating your uh, your program in order to limit the development of resistance to different types of uh, of uh, anticoccidials would be a good strategy. Uh, other factors like physiological stress that uh, can increase necrotic risk, whether that is uh, heat or cold stress, which can affect the tight junctions and allow for bacteria to come into the bloodstream. Um, things that affect litter quality. So wet litter um, is a, a big factor for increasing uh, the Imeria cycling. Uh, and this applies particularly in vaccinated flocks. Uh, but can have an impact also in, in uh, chemical controlled or, or ionophore controlled flocks if you don't have good, uh, good Imeria control. And what that does is uh, Imeria need a certain level of moisture in order to reproduce. And so the more you can reduce the, uh, the, the cycling of Imeria by having a drier environment would be helpful. So things like reducing stocking density is also a factor. In also uh, litter type and ventilation as well as watering lines are all related to factors that help reduce the overall amount of moisture going into your barn and predisposing um, your factors. Just to check here, I have a notice came onto my screen that uh, my internet connection isn't stable. Do I still have everyone online? We're here, we can hear you. Okay, just wanted, to, just wanted to check. And the last one uh, is also having a good insect control strategy. Uh, we do know that darkling beetles are a known vector for transmitting uh, Clostridium uh, perfringens. So making sure you do have good insect control in your barns is another factor. So beyond that, there are uh, other known strategies. One is medic medicinal uh, uh, additives. So bacitracin is one that is uh, currently approved. Now, uh, the other one that is still allowed, and these are, well, bacitration is a class three, and avulomycin is currently unclassified or class four. And these are medicinal additives that help target the bacteria themselves. Uh, however, we do know that uh, Chicken Farmers of Canada has a goal to reduce the use of preventive category three antimicrobials. And in some cases, uh, some of the ultimate uh, end users of our uh, chicken um, have demanded or requested uh, the limitation of the use of certain additives, such as avilomycin. So these uh, tools, while still available in certain instances, um, may become more limited in the future, and that will open up the, the, the world for uh, more risks for necrotic unless we have alternative control strategies. And that's really where we come in with other uh, feed technologies. So many of you have heard of phytobiotics or essential oils, for example, from plants. There's probiotics, prebiotics, organic acids, uh, immunoglobulins and bacteriophages, all working from a different uh, type of mode of action. But one that I will highlight here is the whole idea of adaptive immunity through vaccination really hasn't received a lot of attention with when it comes to necrotic enteritis. And that's really where uh, Huva Pharma has come in with the, the necrotic enteritis uh, type A vaccine. So the vaccine itself is a recombinant attenuated salmonella vector vaccine. So it's an RASV technology. And what it does, is it has genes encoding for fragments of both the alpha and net B toxins. And what that does is that uh, when administered to uh, the chicks at day of hatch uh, through the hatchery can induce a, an immune response uh, through mucosal antibodies right at the site where the disease has the biggest impact at the gut level. And it does that through uh, stimulating uh, IgM, IgA and IgY immunoglobulins against those two major toxins, preventing the development of the lesions that lead to necrotic enteritis. So now that we know what the vaccine is in a general sense, uh, let's talk a little bit about how the enzyme or the vaccine works from a, uh, a performance perspective. So this first slide uh, that I'm gonna present is really um, the clinical efficacy data. So you'll notice that there are three different slide, uh, th graphs, pardon me, uh, all showing uh, mortality due to necrotic enteritis. And there are three separate studies done at one location 
uh, over time. And all three are set up the same way where we have four treatments. The first treatment is where we don't have vaccination. So they're not vaccinated with the, the CP vaccine. And they don't have either Imeria challenge for COXI or uh, administered uh, clostridium perfringens as a challenge. So in this case, in all three studies, as you would expect, there is no mortality because we haven't challenged them. The second treatment is similar to the control. The only difference is that uh, we've administered Imeria as a predisposing factor. And in this case, because we don't have a pathogenic strain of Clostridium in uh, these birds, even though they may have Clostridia in their gut, uh, do not have necrotic enteritis mortality either. The third treatment, the one with the highest mortality, is where the birds are both vaccinated or and or not vaccinated, challenged with both Imeria and Clostridium perfringens with a pathogenic strain. And you'll see in all cases, we have anywhere between 30 to 35% mortality, which is what we would call a very hot strain. And this is the type of model that we use typically for uh, drug situations, for things like uh, necro um, for bacitracin, uh, Virginia mycin, uh, selenomycin, or not selenomycin, pardon me. Um, Avilamycin uh, to, to demonstrate efficacy for claims purposes with uh, regulatory agencies. And then the fourth treatment, uh, which is the uh, reddish pink bar on the far right in all the three graphs, is where they were both challenged with Clostridium and Imeria, but also they had been pre vaccinated at day of hatch. And we see in all cases a significant reduction in uh, the mortality due to necrotic enteritis. So some of you may be saying, well, it doesn't reduce it to zero. And the answer really is no. Uh, but in my experience and uh, published literature shows that under these kind of severe challenge conditions, drugs don't even get you down to zero percent, um, such as bacitracin or otherwise. So it's a, uh, again, it's another tool in the toolbox to help us. Um, in the absence of some of these other uh, strategies that we have been using in the past. So now we've talked about mortality, but how does it work on uh, performance? So here we're gonna go into to, uh, some performance trials in the field. So this first one was a study done here in Southern Ontario in 2021. And you'll notice that it was done in December. So kind of a challenging time of year where we have uh, potential te temperature uh, stresses and tighter barns, so potentially more moisture. In this case, we had Ross 708 mixed sex marketed at different ages. And in this particular case, this producer had three different farm locations with uh, two barns on each site. And so we had three control barns and three test barns on each site. And uh, what was interesting is they added a fourth farm uh, with no infeed antibiotics on a fourth location. And in this particular case, um, it was uh, added over and above. So in, what was uh, done in this case is uh, the birds were vaccinated at the hatchery as normal with Merix and bronchitis. And they were also vaccinated with coccidiosis. So they had uh, the coxie vaccine. And whatever was in the feed previously, was it what was in the feed? Nothing was changed uh, nutritionally with respect to vaccinated or not. And then the only difference is those barns that received vaccinated chicks were vaccinated at the hatchery with the Clostridium perfringens vaccine. So if we look at the overall livability, uh, again, not everyone uses livability, but it's the inverse. So if we look at the control, uh, these are the barns that were not vaccinated had a mortality of almost uh, of around 8%. And uh, those that were vaccinated, the matched barns, um, ha had a mortality of uh, only about uh, 6%. So it was about um, a 1.8% reduction in uh, relative mortality. When you add the fourth barn uh, with the non-matched control, uh, had a, a slightly better response. Uh, but uh, to me, the, the best data or the most representative data is looking at the 1.8% reduction in mortality with the vaccine. <laughs> so we've talked about um, how the birds perform on a livability perspective, and these are under non-challenged conditions. These are field data, not challenged. 
is when we look at the uh, relative performance. So you'll see here on the far left is the control and uh, on the far right is the matched three barns. And in this case, there were no difference in, in uh, performance statistically because we had only three barns. It's hard to do field studies with uh, statistical significance. However, uh, from a general performance, we didn't see a loss in performance. In fact, we saw numerically uh, slightly higher body weights. We're only talking about seven to 10 grams. Uh, but interestingly, we did see an improvement of about two points in fee conversion. So those key numbers will come back a little bit uh, later on in the presentation. Another study, this one done in uh, British Columbia, again, over the similar time frame between November of 2021 to January of 2022. Again, we're using a slightly different breed, Ross 308s, in this case marketed anywhere between 37 and 47 days. Uh, and in this particular study, they had 15 uh, control barns and 15 test barns, which were kind of a top or bottom floor uh, approach or, or a side A and a side B. And in this case, uh, they used a total of about 220,000 birds on either the control or the test uh, uh, program. Similar um, to what we have in normal situations, this is a continuous flow through system. And in British Columbia, they have uh, tend to have higher disease pressure. And in this case, they had issues with uh, uh, infectious laryngotracheitis, infectious bronchitis, uh, which induce higher levels of mortality. So these numbers may not be representative of what you see perhaps in Alberta or, or Manitoba or Ontario, but is what you would typically see for RWA type flocks in British Columbia. And similar to the last study, they were vaccinated uh, as normal at the hatchery with either Marix or bronchitis or both. And the only difference between the control and test is they were vaccinated at the hatchery with the clustered imperfringens vaccine or not. So if we look at the uh, livability response, similar to what we saw in the previous study, uh, again, we saw slightly higher mortality, almost uh, 11 to 12% on the control. Uh, but we had a one and a half percent reduction with uh, vaccinated uh, birds under these conditions. So nice response between both studies. And if we look at the overall uh, performance response, um, we see here that uh, from a body weight perspective, uh, the CP vaccinated birds were about 63 grams heavier than the control birds and had a similar fee conversion, although numerically uh, slightly lower. And if you adjust for a common body weight, it'll be about two, per, two points better on, in terms of relative fee conversion. Uh, a third study, this one uh, was done uh, in Ontario as well, uh, not at the same location as uh, the previous uh, one that I mentioned. In this case, uh, this producer uh, had production locations both in Ontario and Alberta. And using Ross 708 mixed birds uh, marketed anywhere between 37 and 43 days, uh, they had a total uh, in their data set of 67 RWA flocks that we included in the overall analysis, including 16 flocks that we included as uh, pre-study controls. Unfortunately, this study wasn't done uh, or executed as uh, uh, as a balanced study with control and um, test flocks side by side, it was more of a field uh, evaluation. So there is some noise in the data. Um, but what I'm going to present here is uh, the, the overall data for Ontario results only um, so that uh, we get a, a very clear picture and that's due to uh, availability of time. Similar to the previous studies, again, they had standard vaccinations at the hatchery um, and the only difference was the flocks that received the vaccine, the clustered imperfringens vaccine, were put in some barns and not in others. Um, in this particular field, look, uh, field study, uh, there were a number of different factors that include uh, to include here or to mention. One is that there was an RWA uh, approach, so there were no in-feed antibiotics used at all. And uh, because it was a field study, there were variable in-feed antibiotic alternatives that were specific to the various feed suppliers that were included in the study. So those were either included, they were included across the flocks relative to, uh, irrespective of which 
uh, control or test barn they went in. So there were no differences in the feed. And the only other um, uh, factor here is that some farms had acidification on farm and others did not, which does mean that there is some, some uh, noise in, in the data. So what we did to control for some of those factors, and you'll see that on the following slides where we talk about the, the results, is uh, the factors like days to market, because you saw anywhere from 37 to 43 days can have a big impact on market weights as well as feed conversion under um, commercial conditions. So we used uh, the number of days to market as a co-variable in the analysis. We also used uh, the influence of timing. Uh, so in order to court, adjust for differences in when the study was conducted, because you start from November and you go one year, you have summer flocks, winter flocks, spring and fall flocks all mixed in. And we know that birds perform differently at different times of the year. So we use quota period uh, as a proxy. And the last one is study uh, geography uh, was also factored in here uh, because we do know that uh, in some cases, uh, wheat versus corn based. So corn is more of an Ontario type of uh, fee base, whereas wheat is more of a Western Canada type feed. So when we take some of those uh, factors into consideration, we can pull out some noise in the data. So if we look at uh, the overall control versus vaccinated flocks, this is the Ontario data only. You can see here that the vaccinated flocks, of which there were 18 in the uh, database and only three in the control, uh, we saw numerically higher uh, mortality. It should be noted though that uh, the flocks that were selected for the field study uh, for the vaccinated uh, flocks were those that had a history of issues with necrotic enteritis where they had 50 to 100% of the time they were having necrotic issues whereas the control flocks did not. So it's not unexpected that you have slightly higher mortality. What was interesting uh, is when we looked at the data and we corrected for factors like feed supplier, quota period, and the days to market, and you'll see those uh, details at the bottom of the slide. When you correct for some of those factors and you look at uh, feed conversion in vaccinated versus not, we saw about a three percent or a three point improvement in, in relative feed conversion. Now it wasn't statistically significant, uh, however, that is uh, partly due to a smaller number of control flocks and obviously a lot of noise in field data. Similarly, when we look at the market weights, in this case, uh, we had a, a tendency, uh, so almost 95% confidence that we had improvements in market weights. In this case, nearly 100 grams better body weight over the same, uh, over the same age. So we have some uh, some interesting results. And what does that mean from an economics point of view? So this is uh, strictly the the data for uh, for for not just for Ontario, but the average performance data when we look at the number of studies that we've conducted and we average the relative improvements in fee conversion, body weight, and mortality. So if you look at uh, the average improvement in fee conversion that we've seen is two points. The average improvement in body weight, despite what the data from Ontario shows, is only 50 grams. And the reduced mortality by uh, roughly 1.4%. If we look at that versus non-challenged flocks, we see an ROI of about 3.3 to 1. Uh, and in a flock of 30,000, uh, for one cycle, it's about $3,500 better uh, uh, improvement. Now, those values will change depending on what the average feed costs. So uh, just bear that in mind that uh, the, uh, the actual ROI will be uh, influenced by a number of factors that change over time. But it does give you a good indication that there is uh, some, some advantages to using the vaccine. The last one is another Ontario field trial. Again, a different uh, producer. In this particular case, uh, similar to uh, previous studies, they had mixed sex broilers. Uh, and marketed anywhere from 33 to 37 days. And this study was run uh, over a, a good year, uh, just over a year. And uh, they'd had, again, uh, a total of 79 different flocks with three different feeding programs. They had an RWA program with an in-feed solution. This is the uh, black box that could contain any of those solutions that I mentioned earlier, whether it's prebiotics, probiotics, uh, essential oils, uh, organic acids. All of that was in there, and uh, I don't know what was in there because that was kept confidential. 
Um, and then we they also ran the study uh, where they used the RWA without an in-feed solution just to see how the vaccine uh, can perform without anything in the feed. And they also ran it with, in a conventional medicated program uh, with only 12 flocks. So similar to what we did with the, uh, what they did with the previous studies, everything that was done at the hatchery was the same. The only difference is vaccinated flocks versus non-vaccinated. Similar to the previous study that I just showed in Ontario, they had multiple feed suppliers. So as we did with last time, I corrected for some of those factors by uh, using co-variables for quota period, days to market, and the feed supplier to remove some of the noise and really get a good picture of what the vaccine is actually doing. So here, if we look at the uh, overall impacts on market weights, uh, RWA program, including the in-feed solution, we can see that vaccinating the flocks had no relative benefit on market weights. If you look at the RWA program where there is no in uh, um, in feed solution again the vaccine did not add a lot of uh, of relative benefit however if you look at moving from a pr rwa program with an in feed solution to an rwa program without an in, in feed solution but vaccinated you get uh, a, a slight improvement in body weight if we look at the same impacts on feed conversion you'll see here in a rwa program that already has a good in-feed solution, there's not uh, a lot of benefit in moving to the vaccine. However, if you have a naked, what we call a naked RWA program where you have no in-feed solution, there is a big impact of about 11 points in feed conversion. Uh, if you were making the choice to move from an RWA program with an in-feed solution to an RWA program without an in-feed solution but vaccinated, you do lose uh, a little bit on feed conversion. Uh, but I'll come back to why that might be a little bit less relevant overall uh, in a couple slides. And here's the overall impacts on uh, mortality. So again, when you add the, the vaccine to a good strong RWA program with an in-feed solution, vaccination doesn't add a lot of value. However, when you exclude uh, in-feed solutions and you add the vaccine, there is an improvement in relative mortality. In this particular case, perhaps not as high as what we've seen in some of the others. But if you uh, are talking about moving from an RWA program with an in-feed solution to an RWA program without in-feed solution, but vaccinated, you do get that one and a half or 1.4 points in mortality that we've seen previously. So when we add all of these uh, solutions together and you look at comparing what this producer was doing, an RWA program with an in-feed solution, and potentially moving to uh, replacing their in-feed solution with a vaccination approach. And you put those numbers that I've just showed into uh, the, the cost estimator. And the big caveat here is uh, I've only put the assumption that it costs about $10 per ton for the in-feed solution. Uh, this producer said uh, $10 is conservative. They assumed that it was, uh, they actually said it was higher than that. If we look at the relative ROI, um, the ROI is only 1.1. So you might say that it's a wash. However, if you look at the economic benefit to the producer, it still brings about $1,100 um, for a 30,000 bird flock. And if you say that, well, that's uh, over six and a half cycles a year, that can be about $7,500 a year for the producer. Um, so that could be an economic advantage to moving to that program. And in fact, this particular customer did just that. They moved away from uh, their in-feed solution and more to uh, a, a vaccinated approach. Um, if you uh, look at uh, that and compare those programs, again, RWA without an in-feed solution and the vaccinated program with an, without an in-feed solution, uh, the ROI is closer to 3.6 to 1. So if I go back here, you're talking about RWA with in-feed solution and a non-RWA with vaccinated, there's still a value. But if you move to a non-vaccinated -vac uh, uh, without an in-feed solution, the ROI is much, much higher. In this case, 3.6 to 1 and a producer value of nearly $25,000 a year. So overall, uh, just to try and wrap things up here, uh, as we know, uh, there is a re-emerging issue with uh, necrotic enteritis. Uh, we've seen that uh, since the uh, 
reduction of um, conventional antibiotics being used, particularly in antibiotic-free systems. Um, and with the known position of Chicken Farmers of Canada looking and working towards reduction, voluntary or otherwise, to those, we really need new solutions. So uh, this vaccine, uh, the Clostridium perfringens type A vaccine can be a cost-effective solution uh, to help mitigate some of these subclinical issues with necrotic enteritis under commercial conditions as we've seen. Uh, and the key here is that uh, this is the only vaccine uh, that is available on the market uh, specifically to control for both necrotic, uh, for necrotic enteritis for the key toxins that it produces, both alpha toxin and net B. So I think with that, I'll be happy to entertain any questions that uh, you may have. Great, thank you, Greg. That was a great presentation. Uh, folks, I'll just remind you that if you have any questions uh, for Greg, uh, please put them in the question and answer box. It's just easier for me to find them there than to be bouncing back and forth between the chat and the, and the um, question and answer box. So I'll just give a couple seconds for that to come in. And I, I guess I'll ask a real obvious off the top question, Greg, and that is, is the vaccine readily available? I mean, we're hearing about vaccines for people and there's there's shortages and, and delays and that type of thing. So I'm just wondering, uh, is there a steady and ready uh, supply for the vaccine? Yep. Good, good question. Actually, our, our vaccines are actually produced here in the US. So they're produced in North America, even though Huva Pharma is a Bulgarian company and a lot of our fermentation products come from Bulgaria. Uh, the vaccines are actually made uh, in the US and uh, we don't compete uh, contrary to some other uh, vaccine companies where they also produce in the human health sector. We don't produce for the, for the human health sector in that, in that context. And so there's no issues of vaccine supply. Um, we've presented this technology to all the hatcheries in, in Canada, um, maybe not in the Atlantic Canada, but that's coming next month. Uh, and so they are all aware of the technology and have access to it. So if a producer is interested and they want to try the vaccine, uh, they can ask their, their hatchery and they can get it through them. Perfect. Um, just from, a, if there's anybody from, a, does it, I maybe I missed this. The application can be delivered through existing uh, technology in a hatchery or you have to buy new technology? No, uh, the nice uh, thing is that uh, we've actually tested compatibility and it can be co-administered with the same uh, spray system that you have in your conventional hatchery for uh, for the vaccines that you're currently using, whether that's a coxie vaccine or other vaccines that you spray a day of hatch. Oh, that's awesome. Good, good. Uh, it was interesting to me, you know, this last trial that you just showed where, um, you know, you had the RWA infeed uh, approach versus uh, the vaccination, really, they were kind of running neck and neck uh, yeah. in terms of performance. So it's, it says to me, this is another tool in the toolbox, uh, exactly. but you don't need all the tools necessarily. So, you know, choose your tool uh, yeah. wisely. Um, and so if you have no tools, though, that's really where you you start to see some benefit when you had no, um, no other yeah. strategies in place place. So. Exactly. And again, uh, not every tool works in every situation. So you have to make sure you have to evaluate that it works for your particular production conditions. What was interesting in this case is that it gives flexibility for producers. If they're more comfortable with in-feed solutions, they can go that way. Uh, if you're more comfortable and from a simplicity point of view and for a feed cost reduction, uh, there is some advantage to going to, uh, to the vaccine from an economics point of view for returns for the producer. Um, but that's uh, really a, a choice that uh, the individual hatcheries have to make and the producers have to make for themselves. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I was, uh, I was thinking, you know, just influence that, that a producer has with the, the vaccination programs and, and that type of thing. Often they're, they're dictated or designed yeah maybe by, by the processor or the, the hatchery, uh, that type of thing. So it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, as, as time goes on, um, how, how that unfolds to see um, the influence that producers, you know, once they become informed, might be able to have some say about 
vaccines yep. and, and, and the approach they take. Because one is, one is I can decide what I do on my farm. And the other one is uh, there's a little bit more uh, negotiation, I guess, that has yep. to go on. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The nice thing is sure. we've seen good success uh, so far in Southern Ontario. We have uh, a couple of the major hatcheries have uh, adopted uh, this program uh, as a strategy for, for their businesses. So it is available for, for people to, to try. Um, as I say, it may not suit every situation. Uh, mm -hmm. but that's the whole idea is we're bringing more solutions to the market. Uh, when a lot of our solutions are being taken away from us through legislation or otherwise, at least now we have a new flexible one that can come in that doesn't uh, uh, impinge on the use of antibiotics. Yeah, for sure. I I really appreciated that uh, slide you showed with the complexity of, of factors that affect necrotic enteritis, because although it's a little overwhelming, it's also a little, to me, it's encouraging. Like there's, you know, there's a number of ways that you can approach this and focus and, you know, it, uh, it, it's not like you're shooting in the dark. We we know these are the factors. And so pick one and fix it. <laughs> Work on that and then, you know, go from there. So I, that was encouraging to me. Well, it's a the, kind of a strange way to think about it, but yeah, you know. The, I, I think uh, the thing we often forget uh, as nutritionists or man, uh, field management people is we try to look for one single solution that will do everything. And the reality is uh, commercial production uh there are so many things that happen in the whole production chain on farm through feed production and otherwise that there is no magic silver bullet so the really uh my recommendation is for those that are on the call try new things look at uh, the interaction how can you approach the problem from a number of different angles to come with a solution that uh, brings uh some value to your production and to your customers yeah i i, I really do appreciate that you know the one thing that I was thinking is that whole coxie control. I mean, because of the 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 link between the two, uh coxie control is to me one of the real king uh kingpin pins in, in, in the whole strategy. And so along that line, we're gonna have a presentation, just a little self plug here, but we are gonna have a um webinar next month about coxie control. And I know there's a lot of information out there about coxie control, but it is complex. So every little bit that you can learn uh, is helpful. So just that uh, self plug, sorry, <laughs> to go along with that. But uh, yeah, it's a major one for sure. I was, uh, I was interested to, uh, even some of the tips that you had about the feeding strategies, you know, the reduction of calcium, you know, at one time, we didn't have tools, we have tools to, to do that better. Um, you know, the enzymes that we have now. So there's a number of things that we can do uh, to, to really help with um, creating a nice environment in that gut and not, uh, or a bad environment for the uh, uh, clostridium, but a, a good environment for, for the bird uh, to keep it healthy. So, yeah, I appreciated all of those things. Oh, I see we did get one question here. So it says, um, I missed the first few minutes of the presentation. So if you covered it, I apologize. But what is the vaccine made of? How did you capture and isolate strains of necrotic enteritis or it's clustered heat, but that the vaccine is made up of to protect against the field strain viruses. Yeah. So it's a good question. Uh, I, I did cover some of that. Uh, so it is what we call a re recombinant attenuated salmonella vectored vaccine. So essentially uh, you have a salmonella, which is the vehicle uh, that you deliver the vaccine through. Um, the vaccine is delivered through an inserted plasmid that encodes for genes for the two key toxins or fragments of the two key toxins, net B and alpha toxin that have been in, in inserted into the plasmid. And then once they're inserted into the plasmid, the host cell, in this case, the salmonella, uh, reproduces in the host, produces the, uh, the, the, the antigens, if you will, and then the, releases those to the host, the host, the bird gut, then produces antibodies or immune competence through IgM, IgY, and IgA that mounts the immune response. Now, the, 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 those toxins uh, are kind of ubiquitous. Uh, if you have the right strain, it doesn't matter what strain. They're producing alpha toxin or uh, net B toxin or both. 
And so it's not a matter of which strain perhaps necessarily uh, uh, is represented to represent all strains. It's the, the antigens are relative to clostridium perfringens in general. So it, it works across strains. Yeah. Now, one thing I think that uh, this question prompted and some people might be a little bit concerned about is the whole idea of uh, administering a, a salmonella to your birds. Uh, and so it's a great question and we get that often. Uh, I think the key message here is that the way we've engineered and uh, produced the salmonella is it requires a couple of cofactors and supplements that are only available in vitro when we're producing the vaccine. They're not available in the host, in the bird, and they're not available in the feed. So it's uh, attenuated from that perspective. They don't cycle and you can't actually recover that after seven days in the tissues at all in any of the tissues that we've sampled. So uh, there's no real risk or concern that uh, this particular salmonella, which is a non-pathogenic strain, uh, causes any issues for the birds. Yeah, for sure. I, I really appreciate that you touched on that, Greg, because when you do hear salmonella, it sends off alarm bells right away. So, But uh, not all salmonellas are created equal. And so it's really good that, that you talked about uh, some of those details because Otherwise, it could be a little uh, concerning for sure. Yeah. And I also appreciate that uh, you you address the fact about these field challenges and, you know, different strains. It's it's really about the, the toxins um, and th those are uh, common across all different kinds of uh, strains. Uh, yeah. So uh, you're not actually worried about, um, you know, the strain of the day kind of thing. Uh, you, you, you are dealing with the, the reaction to those toxins. So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, the, the whole vaccine side of things can get complex. Um, and so if being able to to understand it in, in common terms is really important. So for people know what they're doing uh, when they are vaccinating. I don't have uh, any other burning questions and I don't see any others coming up on the screen. I'm gonna give one last chance. Uh, if anybody has uh, any other questions, please uh, submit them in the question and answer box. And uh, if not, I invite you to join us next month. And I thank Greg so much for, for this presentation. It, like I said, it's another tool in the toolbox. Um, and and uh, as you said, as the tools are being sort of restricted, it's good to know that we've got some options uh, to turn to. So.